the killer calling himself Son of Sam was terrorizing all of New York City. Now he had approached a parked car, knelt by the window, and filled the young man and the young woman inside with bullets. A few hours later, the young woman died. On the television news that evening, her mother, Mrs. Moskowitz, through clenched teeth in the midst of grief and anger and feelings of vengeance, cried out, I hope he suffers the rest of his life. We sympathize with that mother in her grief. Jonah would have identified with her fully. Jonah believed that people, with the possible exception of Jonah, ought all of them to get what they deserved. And he hoped that God felt that way also. And when God didn't act like that, Jonah did not like that at all. Last time I had a chance to speak with you, we covered the first couple of chapters of the book of Jonah. You remember that Jonah was called to go to the wicked city of Nineveh, which was, I think, right about that direction over there from where he was in Israel. And he went instead to Tarshish over on the southern coast of Spain, which is about that direction over there. He wanted to be as far away from where God was calling him to go as he possibly could. That trip usually to Tarshish took about a year to make, so he thought he was doing pretty good to get away from God. And then we know the story how God sent the storm and the sailors were fearing for their lives and they cast lots and Jonah ended up being the one chosen and they woke him up and said, what's going on? Why are you sleeping? Why aren't you praying to your God? And he said, well, no, this is all my fault. Just throw me in because God is trying to get my attention. It's my fault. Just throw me overboard and the sea will calm. And they finally, as a last resort, ended up having to do that. And then Jonah was swallowed by the great fish that God had prepared. The second chapter of Jonah is talking about that really is his prayer to God when he's in the belly of the fish. And then let's look at chapter 3 now. Jonah chapter 3, and the word of the Lord came into Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. As we look at the end of the story of Jonah this morning, we see now that Jonah has learned to obey. But he has not yet learned to love. I wonder if church members might not desperately need the story of Jonah this morning because maybe we have learned to obey better than we have learned to love. Our lesson this morning is with God, people come first. 
Open your Bibles, if they're not already there, to the book of Jonah, the fourth chapter. With God, growth is more important than size. Growth is a gradual thing. Everybody goofs. And that is very evident with the first three verses of Jonah chapter 4. Jonah 4, verses 1 through 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was this not my saying when, when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. An angry prophet. The Bible says that he prayed unto the Lord. True, he was angry, but at least he prayed. Down in the hold of the ship, he had not been willing to pray. Not much growth, but a little. He says, take my life. He was suicidal. But at least he refused to take his own life. Before on the way to Tarshish, he had taken things into his own hands. Not much growth, an angry, suicidal prophet, but a little. He was a prophet, and yet he ran away. He was converted, and still he was angry. He evangelized an entire city, one of the greatest cities of his day, and yet he did not love the very people he evangelized. Now that's not very flattering to the human condition. For brothers and sisters, it's very encouraging to my condition. There is no one single experience in life that gives us character. A turnabout, a conversion experience, a change in the direction of your life can take place in an instant. But people grow Christward very, very gradually indeed. And if it took so long for God to grow a saint of Jonah, don't give up on yourself if it's taking God a long time with you. Because with God, growth is more important than size. And if you have fallen this week, God is not about to throw you over. What pleases God is growth. With God, people come first. With God, people are more important even than prophecy. Now, why was Jonah so angry? It was because God hadn't kept his word. Poor Jonah's reputation as a prophet was ruined. Notice back in the third chapter of Jonah, the fourth verse, Jonah 3, verse 4, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried, and he said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There's the prophecy. Now the result in the tenth verse. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. God repented. That's a different word than we use for the repentance of men. It would better read God relented or God revoked the sentence. Does God change? I thought the Bible says, Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. God changed his mind. Perhaps God is not dependable after all. God is changeable. Yes, God is changeable. Let me give you an example. And I brought with me, I know it's hard to see very well, so I kind of put this little thermometer strip on a piece of paper so you could at least see that. This is a strip that we had on our fish tank back when we had an aquarium. And it's marked, graduated from 64 degrees all the way up to 86 degrees. So it's a much smaller range than we'd see on our thermometers. That's a range typically that you keep in a fish tank. So you have a little heater in there and you can adjust the temperature to make it comfortable for the fish. So they don't all die. It didn't work for me. I'm pretty bad at keeping fish, so I stopped doing that. So that's why this was available. 
But what does it say now? It says 72 degrees, so nice job with the climate control people here. But everywhere there's a little graduation, there's a little sensor underneath, and that number lights up green, and it shows 72 degrees, 22 Celsius. Typical of thermometers. Now, if the thermometer is working, it's changeable, but only under an invarying, unchangeable law. It will change from 64 degrees to 86 degrees, but it will do it under the same circumstances exactly the same way every time. Now, God is changeable like a thermometer. God changes controlled by absolutely unswerving, unchangeable, fixed law. And what is the law regarding God's change? The law is this. When man turns, God turns. When man turns, God turns. And we find that in the book of Jonah. Chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. This was the words of the king to his people. Cry mightily unto God. Yet let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who could tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Sure enough, that is exactly what God did, verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said he would do, it un do unto them, and he did it not. When man turns, God turns. All of God's judgments, all of God's blessings are dependent upon man's reactions. All prophecy is conditional, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah thought God was stuck with that prophecy. God was not. Because when man turns, God turns. Now it's possible I'm going to upset some of you with this, but listen very carefully. It's a very popular idea that God is stuck with the church. After all, the prophet has said the church will go through. But remember that God also, through the prophets, made some tremendous promises to Israel that were never kept. Because when man turns, God turns. Brothers and sisters, God is no more stuck with the church today than he was stuck with Israel of old. God is no more stuck with the church today than he was stuck with destroying Nineveh. And if the church goes through, and I believe with all my heart that it will, it will not be because God was stuck with the church, but because like Nineveh, the people within the church repented and turned to God. Because with God, people come first. People are more important even than prophecy. And with God, forgiveness is more important than vengeance. We have here in Jonah a bitter prophet. And when we become bitter, you know, we do some very foolish things. Jonah 4, verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So help me, said Jonah, someone's got to die. And if nobody else does, I will. He would rather be dead than wrong. You know, if all the people who felt that way were dead, we wouldn't have much population left. Ask your spouse, maybe he or she knows someone like that. I'd rather be dead than wrong. Now verses 4 and 5 of Jonah 4. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. One of the great original sit-ins. 
He was going to sit down right here till he got his way. Bitterness makes us do some crazy things, some regrettable things. There's a story of two men in a hospital room. One with his bed by the window and the other by the door. The man whose bed was by the window had a respiratory disease. And he had to sit up for an hour every day to give his chest some relief. As he sat on his bed, he looked out that window. The other man, the man by the door, was bedfast. There's no way that he was allowed to get up and go where he could look out. And so the man by the window described to the man by the door what he saw as he looked out the window. And he described a park with couples strolling hand in hand. He described children playing together. He described ball games out in the field, flowers blooming. The man by the door appreciated that little break in his day. He could feel a bit more in touch with the outside world. It was an enjoyable break from his monotony. But as the days went by, he began to feel a little resentment. Why couldn't he ever have a chance to look out that window? He never got any of the breaks. He wanted to see for himself but that other man had the bed by the window and he began to dwell on the idea that if that man were not there anymore, surely they would give me the bed by the window. And then one night in the middle of the night, the man by the window began to gasp desperately for breath. He reached for the call button. It was just outside of his reach. And the man by the door lay on his back staring at the ceiling as if nothing was happening. So deep was his anger. So anxious was he for that window bed that he did nothing. Resentment. Finally, the gasping ceased. The next morning, they took out the lifeless body, and sure enough, they moved the man by the door into the bed by the window. It took all the strength he could muster, but finally, he propped himself on one elbow, and he, he wanted to get that first glorious look out the window. And when he looked, he found himself staring at a brick wall. You see, like so many of us, it was much too late before he realized that his bitterness had made him destroy the man who was most dedicated to his happiness. Why? Because he was filled with bitterness, resentment, vengeance. Just like Jonah. Verse 5 again. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Remember, Nineveh was the ultimate evil empire in Jonah's day. Those Ninevites, those evil, wicked, sinful, immoral, brutal, detestable, ungodly, abominable people. God needed to utterly destroy those people from the face of the earth, and Jonah had his front row seat. But with God, forgiveness comes before vengeance, because with God, people come first. And now we see that with God, love comes before obedience. With God, love comes even before obedience. Jonah had been half right. He had obeyed God. 
He had finally gone where he was sent, and he had preached his heart out. But he had not yet learned to love the people. And because he had obeyed without love, Jonah, who was half right, was all wrong. He had done all of the right things for all of the wrong reasons. And he went up on that hill on the east side of Nineveh and built himself a little lean-to out of the few sticks that he could find. And like a lot of preachers, he apparently wasn't too good a carpenter because there still wasn't much shade. And there sat Jonah, hot, angry. Verse 6, and the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. And so Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Who knows what kind of plant it is, maybe a squash, cucumber, pumpkin, some broad leaf, fast growing vine. God made it to grow overnight. And Jonah was now in the shade. When Jonah got in the shade, he felt a lot better. Now, maybe it's a bit of a digression in our story here, but I think it's a very important and practical lesson of life. Depression very often comes to us for physical reasons. When you find yourself discouraged and mad at the world and maybe even at God, take a look at the physical aspects of your life and see maybe you've been overworking. Maybe you've been undersleeping, maybe not getting enough exercise, maybe the wrong kind of foods in your diet, or maybe even overdone dieting. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And so, at any rate, Jonah felt better because now he was comfortable. Let's pick up the story again in the fourth chapter of Jonah, verses 7, 8, and 9. And God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. A worm gets into the stalk of that vine, and almost instantly in that hot sun, it withers. The Bible says that God sent a vehement wind. It's probably one of those Scirocco winds that occur in that region that simply burn everything in their path. Those dry Scirocco winds carry fine sand from the Sahara Desert out of Africa, of northern Africa, and they blow vehemently burning the skin and parching the throat. People and animals can suffer from heat stroke very easily when exposed to Scirocco winds. The winds can pass in 10 minutes or they can last for days. Whatever it was, it was vehement, the Bible says. I like to think that maybe it even blew the lean-to over that Jonah was underneath. And there sits poor Jonah under the almost perpendicular Assyrian sun rays. Even the seasoned native won't go out in the sun if he can help it. In the midst of the day, he will sit in the shade. He will travel at night. But there sits poor Jonah, burning from the sun and burning with anger. Now, it seems to me that we learn two tremendously important lessons from this fourth chapter of Jonah. The first lesson is we must learn to care about people. Verses 10 and 11, then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for which you haven't labored, you haven't made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle? Jonah, you cared about that gourd. You missed it when it was gone. You didn't make it. You didn't plant it. You didn't grow it. You had it for one day. 
Don't you understand, Jonah? If the people of Nineveh were gone, I would miss them like you missed the gourd. I made them. I have been with them through every breath that they had ever breathed. I care about these people. I would miss them like you missed the shade. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth that whosoever, even the Ninevites, believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Brethren and sisters, we must learn to care about people like God cares about people. A pastor was counseling with a woman. Her husband was running around. He was a fellow who had some serious personal problems. She said, Pastor, I could give him up if, and then his mind kind of raced ahead and he wondered what she was going to say next. He was thinking, yeah, I've heard kind of this stuff before. When I've counseled people, like maybe I could give him up if I had enough of a financial settlement or maybe if I had somebody else in my life or if I had the skills to support myself, you know, something like that. But you know what she said? One of the most beautiful God-like statements of love that pastor had ever heard. She said, I could give him up if, if I knew he would be all right without me. That's learning to love. Caring about people regardless of the circumstances. And we could never love like God until we learn to love people. 1 John 4.20 The one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Verse 12 If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us if we love one another. The second lesson we learn from Jonah for people are more important than personal comfort. Jonah says, God, I feel the same way about people that you feel about physical comfort. And surely people are more important than comfort. Or are they? I want each of us to take a close look at our own lives now. You see, it's really basically a lesson in stewardship, isn't it? What do I put first? Am I a Jonah that I put my gourd vine ahead of thousands of people? What comes first? My comfort or people? Where does my money go? Let's get real, real, real close to Jonah. What is the first choice in my spending money? My gourd that is my air conditioner or maybe my evaporative cooler? Or the mission offering? The people across the ocean or maybe down in South America or just across the border into Mexico or how about the people in my neighborhood? Which comes first? Which comes first? My hobbies, my electronic gadgets, my cable or satellite with 300 channels? Or giving to a place like Adra or Maranatha or Adventist World Radio? The offering went today. Which comes first? The local church budget and evangelistic programs that the church starts to bring Jesus to this community? or adding that addition to my house. Which comes first? The truth of the matter is, there's a whole lot more of Jonah in all of us than perhaps any of us are free to admit. When we put physical comfort ahead of people, we have not yet learned Jonah's lesson. Success, brethren and sisters, is, is proven by what we do for others not by the number of physical comforts and joy. Jonah had helped the Lord to convert tens of thousands of people, and yet he thought himself a failure. He hadn't learned that lesson. 
Success is proven by what we do for others and not the number of comforts enjoyed. Who's the most successful person in this church? The one who drove up in the fanciest car? The one who's going to go home shortly to the biggest house? Success in the sight of God is proven not by the number of comforts enjoyed, but by what we do for others. I always go back in my mind to Matthew 25 when Jesus was talking about the great judgment when all are gathered before him. And he places the sheep on one side and the goats on the other side. And when he describes the differences between these two groups of people, those who are saved and those who are lost, it comes down to very simply those who are the sheep, the ones who are saved, are the givers. The ones who are the goats, the ones who are lost for eternity, are the takers. And even then, God considers more with how much love we work than the amount we do. Now let's quickly summarize the lessons of Jonah. When we talked last time, Jonah showed us that when you start to run away from God, you head toward failure. And when you follow God's plan for your life and head for Nineveh, you succeed. Down in the belly of that fish, Jonah learned that no matter how far we may have gone from him, God wants us back. And finally, today we learn that Jonah ended up at the edge of that ocean, a one-legged Christian. He had learned to obey, but he had not yet learned to love. And there the book of Jonah ends. Did Jonah ever learn his lesson? I imagine he did, because otherwise I'm not sure he would have written the book. But the far greater question today, have you and I learned the lesson? Will we learn it today? With God, people come first. With God, love is more important even than obedience. Love in action is more important than tending to our own personal comforts, our own selfish desires. Are we givers or are we takers? Have we learned Jonah's lesson? How like Jonah we are. Sometimes we can teach God's people in Sabbath school class, teach, teach, teach in the children's divisions a very selfless job. We can preach to them from the pulpit. We can serve them by being deacons and deaconesses and elders and board members without ever loving them. That's the message of Jonah to us today. I want to leave you with just three short quotations from the spirit of prophecy. There is nothing the church lacks so much as the manifestation of Christ-like love. Secondly, just as soon as we love God with all our hearts and our neighbors as ourselves, God will work through us. And then finally, the love of Christ in the heart will do more to convert sinners than all the sermons you can preach. What we need is to get the love of Christ. How do we get the love of Christ? 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. How do we get to know God? We get to know God by spending time with Jesus, time studying his word, time talking with him in prayer, time using our talents to serve him. Thinking of others. It's all about time, how we spend our time. And folks, I think it's about time. 
Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we serve a God who is so patient, so loving, so forgiving. Lord, as we've all had a chance to examine our lives today in the light of Jonah's story, we see that we're a lot like Jonah. Lord, we've come to worship you today on your holy day because we want to obey your word. We do things that we know are the right things to do that a Christian is supposed to do. We want to use our talents to serve you. And Jonah went and preached to 120,000 people in that great city of Nineveh and didn't even love them. May we examine our hearts and where we stand before you today, each one of us, Lord. Because what we need is Jesus in our hearts to change us, to give us that love that can only come from God. And may you so fill us with that love each day as we come to you in prayer and study and service for you. May we draw closer and closer to you. May we be so filled with that love that we will overflow it to our spouses, to our children, to our families, to our neighborhoods, to our fellow church members, to a world that is dying. And may we tell of your perfect salvation. Lord, my prayer today is that each one of us will turn our eyes upon Jesus. Look full in your wonderful face that the things of earth, and we are so blessed in this country, and we get so wrapped up in the things that we have and the things that we want and the things that bring us happiness. May the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and in the light of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.